Good morning, everybody. So when I was 10 years old, I went to a summer camp called Canacuck in Branson, Missouri. Some of you may have heard of Canacuck or maybe even been to Canacuck. Uh, I went to Canacuck for three years. It was awesome. I loved it. We actually have a picture, oh, there it is, of my second year, me, me getting on the bus to go to my second year uh, at camp. You can't really tell from my face, but I was very excited to go to camp. I mean, I'm already, look at me, I got my bowl cut, haircut. I have a Budweiser t-shirt on. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure what that was all about. Uh, but my second year at camp was by far my favorite. Made some great friendships, made memories, had a blast. Everything about that week was awesome until the last night. Because the last night, my counselor sat us all down. Everybody in my cabin, there's about 10, 10 of us campers, sat us all down, and he said something shocking to us. He said, I just need to confess to you guys that I have a disease. And this disease is fatal. It's a deadly disease. We're all like, oh man, that's, that's awful. And then he drops this bomb on us. He says, and this disease is contagious. And, and because you've spent this week in this cabin with me, you all now have this deadly contagious disease. And we're all like, what? <laughs> oh my, we're gonna die? Like, can I even go home? Am I gonna give it to my parents? And I'm sitting there thinking, like, you are the worst camp counselor ever. <laughs> How did you not tell the camp you have a deadly, contagious disease that you're going to spread with all these children? So we're all freaking out. And then, the, and then the counselor tells us what the disease is called. And he says, and the disease is called sin. And we're like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Woo! We thought it was something real bad. Like, oh, that's, that's it? Oh, no, I already had that. I already had that. I'm pretty sure there's a cure for that. Like, whoo, it's just sin. So this counselor was trying to create this powerful spiritual moment. It totally backfired because we're all like super relieved that we're just sinners, you know, eternally separated from God without Jesus instead of like having Ebola or something, whatever we thought that he was giving us. Um, but I'll come back to that story in just a second. You'll probably see why I told it here in a second. But today we are in part three of this sermon series that we're calling Holy. And normally we try to come up with like a clever title for the series, like Behind the Curtain or The Inescapable Ought. This one we just called Holy. We wanted to be really straightforward with this, with this title of the series. Um, and when Matt brought the, the idea for this series to our sermon planning meeting, I, I um, totally, I just loved it right away. Immediately, that's the word I was looking for. Immediately liked it. Um, and here's why. Because I think, and this, this is my opinion, I think that the idea of holiness is something we're actually a little bit resistant to. In our modern day American church, I think sometimes we can be a little resistant to the idea of holiness. Um, and honestly, the, the word holy can have some negative connotations in our culture, right? People are like, oh, they think they're so holy, or they're holier than thou, or uh, holy roller. You know, it's kind of used to, to talk about people who are self-righteous. Uh, so, so maybe that, that, that's what some people think when they hear the word holy. Other people probably think like to live a holy life is like boring, like uh, you know, holiness equals kind of a prude, boring, can't do anything fun, life, like kind of like eating your vegetables or flossing. It's like, well, I, I know I should be holy, but it doesn't really sound that enjoyable. You know, so, so some, sometimes the idea of holiness makes us a little, a little uncomfortable, a little resistant. But while we un, un, might be uncomfortable with the idea of holiness, we are all too comfortable with our own sin, especially uh, at a church like Relevant, you know, or a church where we say, come as you are, and we truly mean that. We truly mean come as you are. We want everybody to be part of the church, to know that this is a place for them. They're welcome here. They can belong. They can grow here. They can be an authentic part of what the church was meant to be. But sometimes in our accepting and grace-filled culture where we know that, hey, no matter what we do, God is going to love us, and no matter what we do, God forgives us, and we need to be gracious with one another. Sometimes in that culture, it can be easy to sort of downplay or dismiss our sin. Sort of like me and my, my buddies at camp, like, oh, it's just sin. Everybody's got that. Like, God's got that covered, right? It can be easy sometimes to downplay our sin. But make no mistake, God hates sin. All sin. And we don't really like to use that word hate with God. We don't like to think that God hates anything. But the reality is that's how he feels about sin. God hates sin. You may have heard someone say this statement, that God hates sin but loves the sinner. And that's absolutely true. But too often we gloss over the first part of that statement to get to the second. 
Jerry Bridges, who is an author of a, a book called The Pursuit of Holiness, which Matt has referenced a couple times during the series, he writes this, and this is a very challenging, um, strong statement. He says, we cannot escape the fact that God hates our sins. We may trifle with our sins or excuse them, but God hates them. Therefore, every time we sin, we're doing something God hates. He hates our lustful thoughts, our pride and jealousy, our outbursts of temper, and our rationalization that the ends justify the means. We need to be gripped by the fact that God hates these things. And I love this next statement. I think this sums it up so well. We become so accustomed to our sins that we sometimes lapse into a state of peaceful coexistence with them. But God never ceases to hate them. We need to cultivate in our own hearts the same hatred of sin that God has. Hatred of sin as sin, not as something disquieting or defeating to ourselves, but as displeasing to God. This lies at the root of all true holiness. So this series is a call to stop diminishing our sin and to stop dismissing holiness as something that's not worth pursuing because it's unachievable. I love this series because it is a call to step up to the standard that God has set for our lives. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've put your faith in Jesus, asking him to be the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life, this is the standard for your life. The verse that we've been talking about all throughout this series is, it comes from 1 Peter, and and Peter was an apostle or a, a disciple of Jesus, and he writes this. He says, as obedient children, as those who claim to be followers of Jesus, children of God, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, you know, before Jesus. Don't, like, we know better. Like, don't conform to the sinful desires. Don't give in to your sinful desires. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, and he's quoting God here, be holy, why? Because I am holy. We are to be holy because our creator is holy. And so whether we like it or not, as God's children, this is the standard for our lives. Holiness, moral perfection, perfect obedience, absence of sin, Conformity not to the world around us or to our sinful desires, but to God's unique, holy character. So just just go do that. Let's pray. No, uh, of course the question is, how in the world do we do this? How How in the world do we live holy lives in a world that is anything but holy and that is actually, most of it is leading us the opposite direction of holiness? How do we live in a world where we have an enemy that that Peter writes uh, is like a, a roaring lion prowling around looking for someone to devour? How do we live a life of holiness in the midst of that? Well, first we need to remember that apart from God, we're doomed to fail. We're destined to fail at this. The refrain that Matt shared uh, in the first two weeks of the series was that when it comes to living holy lives, we cannot do what God must do, and God will not do what we must do, right? Holiness is a cooperation between us and God. God went first. God, God through sending Jesus to die for our sins, to, for pe- paying the penalty for our sins, he, he made a way for us to be positionally holy with him. So when we put our faith in Jesus, asking him to be the forgiver of our sins and the leader of our lives, we are, God, we are right with God. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin and our brokenness. He sees Jesus' perfect holiness, And praise God for that, because there's no way we could ever achieve that on our own. It is a gift of God. But our part of this cooperation is that we must now choose to walk in this holiness, to pursue God, to pursue God and what he wants for us. We must choose to fill our minds with the things of God instead of the things of this world, to say no to temptation, to choose what is right, to pursue holiness in how we live. But even that we can't do without God's help. And thanks, thanks be to God, because when we put our faith in Jesus, uh, he actually sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of us and to begin to transform us and, and empower us to live out holiness, empower us to resist temptation and to obey him. So we cannot do what God must do. We cannot do this on our own, but God will not do the walking for us. We have to choose to pursue holiness. And last week, Matt talked about how this starts in our minds and how to be holy, we must fill our minds with what is holy. He talked about filtering what we put into our minds, what we watch, what we listen to, what we consume, and filling our minds with the things of God. Today, we're talking about another vital aspect of walking in holiness, and this is so key. I hope you don't dismiss it. Uh, The main idea for today is that choosing holiness requires 
choosing relationships that will help us be holy. Choosing relationships that will help us be holy. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard all the stats about how, uh, you know, in our society today that loneliness is an epidemic, you know, especially ever since COVID, right? We're more connected than ever as a society, but we're, we're uh, more isolated than we've ever been. I'm sure you've heard a lot of those stats. Well, I heard a new one uh, last week, and this is, the, this is what I heard, that sociologists say that we are the first generation in human history to actually disband our tribes. Typically throughout history, people group up, right? They, they, they move away from isolation into community. They, they start and create cities. They, they, they start tribes, they, they group up. Well, uh, we're actually moving in the opposite direction as a society, more towards individualization and away from community. But pursuing Jesus and walking in holiness was never meant to be an individual thing. Too often in our society, in America, we, we make it an individual thing. It was never meant to be an individual thing. And just like with most things in life, the more we try to go it alone, the more difficult we make it on ourselves. And that's not how God designed us to operate. And the more, that if we truly want to experience God more, if we truly want to live out the holy standard that he has set for our lives, trying to do this on our own is a recipe for failure. And King Solomon, who's a, a king of Israel, um, he knew this all too well. So King Solomon was the son of King David, King David of David and Goliath. It's a really big deal. Uh, his son was Solomon. And when Solomon was young, he was a young and experienced king, uh, God came to him in a dream and he said, ask me for anything that you want and I'll give it to you. Solomon didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for fame. He didn't ask for military success. He asked for wisdom. And God was so pleased with this request that he, he said this, to Solomon. He said, I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So Solomon is known as the wisest man who ever lived. People came from nations around him to, to seek his counsel. And he wrote the book of Proverbs, most of it. Um, and it's a lot of people, there's a little bit of debate over this, but a lot of people believe that he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes as well. And these are two wisdom books in our Old Testament. And we're gonna look at what Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, if you've never read Ecclesiastes, it can be kind of a downer. Uh, the first chapter of the book is entitled, Everything is Meaningless. So it can be kind of a downer. I love Ecclesiastes because uh, they don't shy away from kind of the raw human emotion that we have. And really the point that they're making in Ecclesiastes is that um, really apart from God, life is meaningless. And that God is what gives our life meaning. But in chapter four, Solomon talks about how doing life alone makes, makes life worse and how doing life alone makes life miserable. He talks about how was a, there was this man who was totally alone, he worked all the time, he had tons of money, but he had no family, no friends, no one to leave his wealth for or to, um, and he was not content. And then in, cha in uh, verse nine of chapter four, Solomon turns a corner and he shares wisdom about a better way to live. And we'll pick it up there in verse nine. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor, right? We can do more together than, than by ourselves. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And he says this interesting statement, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And we'll come back to that statement in just a second. But basically what Solomon is saying is obviously life is better with others than it is alone. It kind of echoes what God said at the beginning of creation when he first made Adam. And he looked at him and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. So he created a companion for Adam. That relevant, we have a statement that we say all the time that transformation doesn't happen in an isolation. And so Solomon is saying that two are better than one. And then this, this interesting analogy he ends with, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You may have heard that statement before. It's kind of a famous quote. If you've been to a wedding where they've like, the married couple like ties the strands together to, to symbolize their bond of their marriage with God. Um, so you may have heard of this before, but here's the point. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken because it evenly distributes the weight it is holding between the three strands, right? So it's all three strands share the weight, right? Versus... Uh, it being just cords side by side, uh, where one, the sh whatever the shortest cord would, would carry the most weight. Um, when they're braided together, when they're interwoven, they have more capacity to stretch and ensures the weight is not all just on one of the strands. But this only works when the strands are braided together. It doesn't work when they're separate. 
And a lot of times we think like, oh, the Lone Ranger, the guy or, or girl that's like doing it all, doing life by themselves, man, they must be so strong. But the reality is, and what Solomon is saying here is that we are much weaker than when our lives are interwoven together with other people. But it's not just about being connected to anybody, right? Who we are, or sorry, who we are connected to makes all the difference. Uh, Ronnie likes to say, um, what does he like to say? (laughs) Just had a blank there. Your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. There's another pastor that I respect, he says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. The writers of scripture talk about the importance of having not just people around us, but the right people, people who will lead us in the direction that we're trying to go, that we want to go. Solomon himself writes the following in Proverbs. He says, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. He says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. This one's my favorite. He also says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The Apostle Paul says something similar in the New Testament. He says, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. So who we surround ourselves with determines our path. It's not only vital to have people and be connected, but also to have the right people. So how does this apply to our topic of holiness? Hopefully that's obvious, but let me connect the dots just to be clear. As we've said, choosing holiness requires us to choose relationships that will help us be holy. So we need others who will do four things. We need others who will sharpen and challenge us. As Solomon talked about iron sharpening iron, right? Iron can't sharpen itself. It needs other iron to sharpen it. Otherwise, it becomes dull and useless, right? We need people in our lives who will challenge us, who will call us out, who will keep us accountable, who will check in on our progress. We need other people who will sharpen and challenge us. Second, we need people who will pick us up when we fall. You know, Solomon says, pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. I think of like Mr. T, if you know who Mr. T is, like he always said, pity the fool. So pity the fool who falls and has no one to help them up because we will fall. We will. We will fall. We will have moral failures. We will give in to temptation. And Satan loves nothing more than when we fall, when we stumble, to whisper lies to us. Say, God is so disappointed in you. Don't even bother getting back up. Like you've sinned so many times. Just give in. Stop trying to be holy. Stop. Just just give in to the sin. You'll you'll never get back up. You'll never live out who you want to be. And so we need others who will help us not just stay down in that pit, but who will pick us up when we fall and not let us stay there. We need people, third, who will comfort us when we're struggling. As where Solomon talks about uh, how can can one person keep warm alone, right? We need two people to keep each other warm, that analogy there. But um, we need people who will empathize with us, who are a safe place, who will listen to us and, and not judge, where we can heal. We need people who will comfort us when we're struggling. And fourth, we need people who will protect us from temptation and attack. And a lot of us don't feel like we're in a, like a battle or a war, and so I don't really need protection. But the reality is we are all in a spiritual batter, battle. Batter, battle. We're all in a spiritual battle, right? As I said before, um, Peter, Peter wrote, be alert and of, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan couldn't beat God, so Satan comes after God's children, trying to tempt and to trick us into destroying our lives. So we need people that, um, as, as Solomon said, you know, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. We need people to help us fight the spiritual battle in prayer. We need people who, t- who can help steer, away, steer us away from temptation. And honestly, we need people who can protect us from ourselves. When they see us going down the wrong path or, or putting ourselves in, in bad situations that they know aren't gonna be good for us, we need people that can protect us by helping us get back on the right path. So the million dollar question for you today is who in your life is helping you be holy? Who in your life is helping you be holy? Who is in your cord of three strands? Or are you the lone strand, right? We're, we're weakest when we're alone, right? The sheep outside the flock is the easiest prey. So who is in your cord of three strands? Who in your life is helping you be holy? I wanna share three steps that, that you can start taking to, to choose holy relationship, or to choose relationships that will help you be holy. This isn't rocket science. These are not like epiphanies, but they do take work. And I think sometimes when it comes to relationships, we think that the people that have great relationships are just really lucky 
But the reality is those people work at those relationships. They're intentional with those relationships. They choose those relationships. I heard this great um, quote from a, a pastor. He said, our expectations in our relationships are often higher than our effort. Right? What we expect and, and desire in our relationships is often so much higher than, than the effort that we're willing to give to those relationships. So you've got to decide if pursuing holiness, if pursuing who God has called you to be, is worth that work. So how to choose relationships that will help you be holy. Three steps. Step one, identify your people. Identify people who are or could be in your life interested in growing in their relationship with Jesus. There's an author named James Clear that I love. He wrote the book Atomic Habits, sends out a newsletter every week, email newsletter. It's like the only newsletter that I read top to bottom every single week. Very wise person. He says, your culture sets the expectation for what is normal. Surround yourself with people who have the same goals as you. I love this. It says, rise together. Rise together. And so maybe this idea of identifying people in your life is really easy for you. Maybe you're like, yep, I got them. I already, I already know who they are. Great. Wait for step two. Maybe you've got people in your life that you're like, ah, maybe. I don't know. I might have to have a conversation. I, I, I don't know like, how they, I, I think they might be spiritual people or faith, faith-filled people, but I'm not really sure. So maybe I need to have a conversation with them. Others of you are like, I got nothing. I got nobody in my life who I can think of right now that can help lead me towards holiness. Well, good news. This is why we have the church. Right? This, is, this is one of the reasons why, why God designed us to be in community with other Christ followers, with other people who are trying to pursue the same goals as us. And so we have a room full of people here. We have a, another room full of people at the 9 o'clock uh, that, I believe, want to pursue Jesus, want to pursue holiness. So we have all kinds of people that you can connect with or, or p- have potential connections with that, you, that can help lead you towards holiness. So I, w- I would encourage you, if you've got nobody in your life, start getting to know some people here at Relevant. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. You can join a T-Life group. T-Life groups are for college students and adults. That it's just a group of people pursuing Jesus together. If you're a middle school or high school student, that's what YU and Rooted is all about. You have small groups in those environments, so make those a priority. You can join a team and get to know somebody. It's not like you're sharing your life with the people on your team, but at least you can find things in common with people and, and, and have the beginning of a friendship that you can build on. You can go through Relevant 101. This is a great opportunity to meet people who might be new to Relevant or just trying to get engaged at Relevant. Uh, you can take a class, another great way, way to meet people. So there's all kinds of different ways that you can start connecting with people and then build the relationship from there at Relevant. I want to say one more thing here, just kind of a side note. Um, just like our friends can lead us closer to Jesus, our friends can lead us away from Jesus, right? Bad company corrupts good character. And so I think you've got to look at your life too and, and, and ask if your surroundings, the surroundings that you're, that you're in, are helping or hurting your desire to follow Jesus more. Because there may be some of you that need to, to maybe distance yourself from some groups of friends or something like that in order for you to be successful in pursuing Jesus. So step one, Identify your people. Who in your life is helping you be holy? Step two, be intentional with your people. Some of us have people in our lives, and they're great people, and they can totally lead us towards holiness, but we're just not intentional with those relationships. And I'm totally guilty of this. I've got all kinds of people in my life that are godly people that could sharpen me, but I'm not with them regularly enough, and I'm not intentional enough. Our conversations aren't intentionally around how we can spur one another on towards holiness. So be intentional, right? This doesn't happen by accident. Just because you have people identified in your life doesn't mean those people are helping you, lead, helping lead you towards Jesus. So be intentional. Be with people regularly. Put it on the calendar. Make your conversation purposeful. This is one of the benefits of a tea life group because the time and place is already set. You just got to show up. Just make it a priority. Uh, other ways this could look, you could schedule a, a weekly or monthly coffee or breakfast or lunch or something with a friend. You could do a Zoom, schedule a Zoom call with a friend in a different part of the country. Uh, set a rhythm with it. Give it a rhythm. Thir- third Thursday or something like that and put it on the calendar so that it happens. It's not just up to whether or not you feel like doing it that time. It's, it's on the calendar. My dad is 81. He lives in California. Most of his, his lifelong good friends live in other parts of the country. 
I've never seen a person be as intentional as my dad is when it comes to his relationships. Like, he's still connected deeply to guys he went to high school with. He's very intentional with his relationships. But he has a weekly Zoom call Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. with, with some guys in his life that are trying to pursue Jesus. And together, they sharpen one another. They, they talk about their spiritual lives. He doesn't let distance uh, or different time zones get in the way of being intentional with his relationships that lead him to be more like Christ. It's a beautiful picture of intentionality. There will always be excuses. You will always have an enemy who is fighting against this, who does not want you to be connected, who does not want you to be in a cord of three strands. And in our hurried, busy culture, if we're not intentional about these relationships, it, it won't happen. So how, intention, how intentional are you with your relationships? And step three, be real with your people. Whereas kids say, be so for real. And all the teenagers in the room are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you just said that. Uh, but identifying people and planning time together, those are huge. Those first two steps are huge. But if you aren't real with the people that you're with, if you're not inviting them in, into authentic conversations about your life, all this falls apart. If you're more worried about saving face than growing, this falls apart. If you're not willing to be honest and vulnerable, this falls apart. The relationships are about as good as your willingness to be vulnerable in those relationships. We've got a guy in our T-Life group named Steve. Uh, our T-Life group has been meeting since January, and we're still getting to know each other, but man, when every time Steve is there, it's way better, because Steve is real. Like, he does not shy away from being real, and it makes the rest of us want to be real, and it makes our relationships better, and it makes our conversations more honest and real. And I'm not saying bear your soul in your T-Life group. I'm not saying tell everybody everything about your deepest, darkest secrets. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying you should probably have at least one person in your life, in my opinion, in addition to your spouse, that you can be totally real with, totally honest with. There's a pastor named uh, Rick Bizet, who's a pastor in Arkansas. He talks about the difference between authenticity and transparency. He says, be authentic with everyone. Be transparent with a few. So like, be honest, be real. Don't be fake with everybody, but that doesn't mean tell everybody everything. Be transparent with a few people. And he, he kind of defines transparency as this. He says, everybody needs somebody with whom they can take their heart out and put it on the table, and the other people can see the truth of what's going on in their heart and in their life. Do you have somebody like that in your life? Are you willing to develop and do the work to build these kind of relationships in your life? So identify your people. Be intentional with your people, be real with your people. Because choosing holiness requires choosing relationships that will help us be holy. This isn't gonna happen overnight. You can't microwave these relationships, but I just challenge you to take a step today, this week. Take a step, reach out to a friend about getting coffee and talking about this. Uh, put something on your calendar. Take a step here at Relevant. Um, and then watch God start using that relationship to sharpen you. So I'm going to close with this. When it comes to walking in holiness, a lot of times we can think this is just about, you know, um, a checklist or always doing the right things. Really what holiness and pursuing holiness is all about is our relationship with God. This all comes back to a relationship with God. God showed his love for us by sending his son Jesus to die for us and to, to, to make a way for us to have a relationship with God. God shows his love for us by showering grace and mercy on us each and every day that we don't deserve. We show our love for God by being obedient. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. So holiness is not just about experiencing more of God, that's part of it, but it's also about how we love God, how we live as God's children. So surround yourself with good company. Put yourself in iron sharpens iron situations regularly. Rise together with others to who we are called to be. I want to say one more thing for those who would say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe I'm new to this church thing, but I, I, I don't have that relationship that you're talking about. I want to make it clear to you that no amount of holy living can make you right with God. There's not, you, you can never do enough to be right with God, to be holy enough to be right with God. We cannot live to up to God's standard on our own. We need Jesus. It's through faith in Jesus alone that makes you holy in God's eyes. It's through faith in Jesus alone that allows you to have a relationship with God. 
It's through faith in Jesus alone that God sends his Holy Spirit to live inside you and to begin transforming you and allowing you to walk in holiness. And it's through faith in Jesus alone that we experience the life, the peace, the joy, the hope, the fulfillment that God has designed us to experience in this life. So if you've never begun a relationship with God through Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'll lead you through a prayer that you can pray to put your faith in Jesus today. Pray with me. Father God, um, we need your help as individuals and as a church to live holy lives. It can sometimes feel like a futile effort because we, we feel like we'll never be perfect on this side of heaven, and so what's even the point? But God, I pray that, if, that you would just create a desire in our hearts to pursue holiness, to love you like you have first loved us by being obedient to the standard that you call us to, to be more like you and your holy character. I pray that we would not try to do this alone. I pray that we would group up instead of moving towards individualism, that we would find ways to build and be intentional and be real in relationships. And God, I pray for anyone who has not put their faith in you, that you would stir their hearts to do that right now. And if that's you, you can pray something like this in your heart if you want to put your faith in Jesus. Saying, Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner and I am in need of a Savior and I can't do this on my own. And I declare that you are that Savior because of your death on the cross and the resurrection from the grave. I declare that you are that Savior that I need. Jesus, please forgive me for my sins and lead my life from this day forward. I put my faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.